Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today has rehabbed and stabilized over 450 properties and currently manages more than 900 investment properties throughout the Chicagoland area. He appeared on CNBC and has been a guest on many real estate podcasts. Mark Ainley is partner at GC Realty and Development. Mark, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Well, I appreciate uh, the invite. So uh, hopefully I can uh, be entertaining, entertaining at least for a half hour or so for your, your, uh, your people listening. For sure. We'll, we'll have some fun as we go along. Uh, so to, to kick things off, do you want to tell us about your real estate goals right now? Uh, so my real estate goals, um, it, it's funny that um, you say real estate goals because I, I, I looked at this year and I kind of started my year kind of in December. And, and I did it on a personal level. Now, on a personal level, uh, it sounds silly, but uh, I, I wanted to start working out again. You know, I've been working off, off and on. You know, it's always one of those things I think anybody can kind of say. Um, they, they fall in, they fall out of, uh, and so forth. But uh, I wanted, I, I set a goal in December for the new year that if I start, I, I joined a gym. I joined a personal trainer, actually. And, and I joke around with people. I say, that trainer, I pay him the 30 or $35 a session. I pay him. I pay him only to make sure I go. The rest is just kind of, once I'm there, it's all good. But uh, yeah. he holds me accountable. And that's kind of a, a lesson for a lot of different uh, uh, points in anyone's life. You, you need someone to hold you accountable when there's nobody else. So my goal was to uh, join uh, this guy's gym, personal training uh, situation, and work out twice a week. Now, I know whenever I am working out, I it is, uh, has a whole bunch of other uh, unintended uh positive consequences um, for me, which ultimately spill over into the real estate world. Um, you know, for me, I, I know uh, just uh, if I'm working out, I'm, I'm a little more conscious on how I eat. Uh, you know, I'm a little uh, a little more peppier at two o'clock in the afternoon. I worked out today, so it's three right now. So I'm feeling good still. <laughs> I don't have uh, the crashes that I might because um, uh, caffeine's holding me over. So I'm just whole, uh, so much more productive. Um, and, uh, so my, my personal goals just spilled over into my uh, business goal. Um, on my business side of things, um, some of my uh, benchmarks that I'm trying to hit. Uh, right now, on our property manager side, I do do uh, new business, and, and I have a, uh, a, a goal of getting X amount of new clients and management fees and all that uh, on a quarterly basis. So we really run a lot of our – we run off of the traction model here, the EOS, uh, if any of your people are familiar with that. And so we really sell our goals on a quarterly basis. Um, and then on our development side, our goal, so last year we did uh, uh, the least amount of rehabs uh, as we have in, since 08. And uh, our goal, and it wasn't because we, we didn't want to, it's because it got a lot tougher to find deals, uh, particularly here in Chicago. So uh, I wouldn't say we got lazy, we just didn't put in the extra effort it was going to take to keep up. So we recognized that fourth quarter that, wow, we really did about half of what we've been doing the previous uh, eight, nine years. So we kind of stepped up our uh, efforts to find deals this year. So our, our goal is to find, uh, to buy three units uh, a month uh, to be able to rehab and ultimately either keep or, or sell. Got, gotcha. And with that slowdown in the, the volume you're doing right now, are you uh, building up a war chest uh, for an eventual sh uh, shift? Um, well, you know, it's funny. Um, it's probably not a week that goes by that uh, I sit down and I talk to somebody and, and they tell me like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting on the sidelines. I'm saving all my cash because I know what happened in 08, 09. And I'm saving everything. And uh, to me, um, I don't think we'll ever crash as bad because everyone's waiting for it. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, market correction, crash, is very big difference in that. But, uh, you know, I got into, uh, I got my real estate license in 03 and, and did all the stuff uh, before the crash. And, there's never anyone saying, hey, I'm going to stand on the sidelines, wait for things to plateau out or wait for things to crash. Uh, everyone was all in. Everybody was all in. And that's probably why we crashed as hard as we did. But uh, uh, you, you, we're, we're more conscious in what we're doing. So the deals, when I say we're going to try finding three deals a month, we look at it uh, kind of three ways. We look at it um, either we're going with something. So we have a turnkey model that, uh, you know, anything we buy uh, is potentially always kind of for sale. And our goal is always to make uh, a, a profit on that um, per unit. So our goal is to hit our profit on that, or it's something that we could keep and get at least a 10% return on. You know, we do all add value stuff, so we're always trying to get that uh, double digit. 
or something that we're comfortable to uh, hold on to. If the market did correct, and we have to hold on to it for 10 years. So we kind of measure every property um, down to those three levels right now. So that's kind of how we're looking at uh, whatever the update, upcoming correction could be. Yeah. And, and I think you mentioned something that's really important there where you have multiple exit options on the deals you're doing because lots of people get stuck if they only have that one exit, which is a sale and things can happen. So like you said, like you, you can even hold it, um, you know, if something does happen and uh, you'll still still be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you have any, um, as you're building your business, obviously like your operation is is growing right now. Um, do you have, uh, any routines that you follow besides the, the gym? Like maybe like, um, rituals in the morning or, uh, how, how do you schedule your day to stay focused? Um, so I learned probably about four years ago, um, through, I'm not sure what book, but it was in a book. I, I know that, um, maybe I can figure that out for your show notes, but, uh, I found in a book, uh, the focus was kind of your core time. You know, we might be up 17 hours a day, but of that 17 hours, you might have four, like, really, like, kick-ass hours. And I realized not to do anything else during those hours except kind of focus on uh, uh, my my goals or or the the bigger things I'm trying to accomplish. You know, answering all the emails or or meeting somebody for coffee. I've I've moved those things to the afternoon. So I'm an early person, so I'm usually up about 4 or 5 in the morning, and I take that – that, uh, that, that kind of 6.30 to 6, 6 uh, to about 11.30. And I just, I just kind of uh, put my head down and just uh, keep, keep butt on anything I'm trying to get accomplished. The other thing along those lines right there is I, am, I stopped. I did this probably only about three or four months ago, and it's been huge uh, in the sense of I stopped opening my eyes in the morning and looking at my email. Um, that has, uh, you know, right away, whoever emailed you overnight, has now control taking control of your morning, uh, whether it be something that is a fire to somebody else and you feel obligated to have to uh, uh, handle, or someone might just been a jerk on an email, and then they kind of that's that's the first thing you write in the morning. So I actually do not check emails uh, till probably about uh, a couple hours after I wake up. And one more thing I did that uh, I think has been a pretty cool thing that it, I found online um, a, a little tablet that's waterproof, and I hung it in my shower. Uh, it's a waterproof pencil, a waterproof tablet, and I get so, if I'm not checking my email right when I wake up, my mind's fresh. So I'm going to the shower. I'm not trying to create visuals or anything, but uh, going to the shower and, and I get these great ideas. And a lot of times by the time I exit the shower, you know, get that initial dry and get over to my phone, I forgot what it was. Uh, this is kind of partially my own personal kind of my mind as I always thought around. But I found something that I can write it down in the shower. And I might not remember it. I might not do anything with it the next day, but it's there the next day. Because if I'm writing it down, it's something that I really want to make sure I address. So those are a couple of things that kind of changed in my mornings. Yeah, I, actually, I, I like the tablet idea because I, I think we've all done that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're lathering up the shampoo and then, uh, you know, we have a great idea and then it disappears. So, yeah, and, yeah. Well, think about it. If you don't have, if, if you don't have that, uh, that uh, intrusion of your email or your text message first thing in the morning, think about it. Your, your mind is so fresh, assuming you've got a good night's sleep, which is something I always – so everyone's a little different, but I always try to get uh, no less than six hours sleep. Like uh, uh, if I get anything less than six, I feel it. So, yeah. Uh, but your mind's still fresh right there and then. So, gotcha. And, and uh, you had mentioned before that uh, you're working harder at finding deals now, just given the market conditions. Um, what are some of the changes you've made inside your business uh, to to go after those deals that are hard to find? Um. So what we realized is the on-market deals, you know, it's true. The, the analysis has, for the most part, uh, dried up uh, here in Chicago. Um, I mean, it has for a few years on the north side, but we're, a lot of what we do on the south side and south suburbs, it's really drying up now. But, uh, you know, I started a few years ago uh, really trying to build relationships. Because I saw this coming eventually, but building relationships with all of the, uh, the wholesalers. Uh, some, of them, some are true wholesalers, some of them are, are wannabes, but they have access to the deal no matter what. And uh, and making sure those guys know that I'm ready and prepared. And, and so as a little tip, if you've got a wholesaler, you're, you're, you're trying to uh, make sure he lines up. What, what we do is, uh, you know, I'll send him, uh, we'll follow up with those guys once a week uh, to make sure that they, they were front and center on their mind. And, and uh, the one guy in my office, Louie, he actually, even, uh, he'll send uh, proof of funds every week. <laughs> hey, we're ready, man. Uh, we want to make sure when you get that deal this week, we're ready. So they see an updated cash, uh, he sends it to four or five of his guys. 
uh, an updated proof of funds uh, every week. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've never heard of anybody doing that, but I, I love it. That's uh, that's nice and aggressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So front and center. Who's got yeah. the money wins? For sure. And, and you also bring up too, like it's those, it's those relationships, right? You can't just go on MLS or realtor.com and expect to find deals. Like it, it's the contacting the people rubbing shoulders. That, that's where the, the true money is. You had mentioned that you had been on uh, before, before we were talking on, uh, before we started recording that you had been on a reality show with real estate. What kind of impact did that have on, on your business? Well, you know, the, uh, the show ended up being, um, uh, more about our company and our, and our growing pains. Uh, for anyone that hasn't watched the show, um, ultimately we were approached to do a reality show. And the show that they really originally approached us for, they, uh, you know, we were a little too uh, uh, successful, I guess, for whatever they wanted to do to us, embarrass us, whatever, on whatever show they originally had planned for us. So we, um, in just kind of talking with the, the people screening us, you know, we have fairly good charisma, me and my partner, and, and they like that. So, you know, just in general conversation, we, we were talking about how we, we bought the wrong house. So one of our other ways that we buy property is off the judicial sale. And uh, through a simple era of flipping a number, we thought we were buying a single family home across the street. And we bought the two flat across the street that was uh, a far larger scope. Um, and uh, they, they thought that to be a fun story. So we got to go on there. And, but the story really was it more about how the growing pains of, uh, you know, the you know, little errors and not have enough systems in place. So, you know, we got to get a little mentoring along the way. So it's a cool experience. And, you know, it's off the bucket list TV for me. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm done uh, with that. So there's a lot of work for 42 minutes of uh, airtime. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. And, and speaking of uh, all those deals you've done, is there one that stands out as a, as a keystone deal or one that, um, you know, had a big impact on you? Well, you know what, I, uh, it sounds silly and simple, but the first couple of deals I did were probably the ones that set such a tone for where my career went. Um, the first um, place I bought was, <laughs> so I, I moved to California for a year, and I moved out of my mom's house, my parents divorced, moved to California for a year, and I came back, and I'm like, I really don't want to live with my mom, I'll live with my dad. And so I stayed with my dad, and my dad, uh, my dad, uh, he, got a girlfriend ended up moving in with him so like, you want to just rent the place i'm like all right i'll rent the place and uh after you know probably about 60 days of him coming over on saturday morning and seeing, i was 20 years old 2021 and uh seeing it more of a flop house with all my friends because uh, uh, i was one of the first people to have my own place so um everyone would be my place and uh, he basically said listen i need you out or i need you to buy this place for me because you're too much of a liability i don't know what the hell you're doing here on the weekends and, and I, i'm not gonna end up uh uh, paying for your, your, your dumb mistake. So also I said, all right, I'll not really understanding what I was doing. I said, all right, I'll buy it from you. So, um, I bought it. And, uh, ultimately right after that, my friends, um, you know, again, we're, we're young age and they're going through their own struggles, with their family and they need a place to stay. So I ended up having people on my couch, uh, but charge them three, $400 a month. Um, and my mortgage taxes, my, my PITI, everything was like 900 bucks. So I was actually making living there with two of my buddies and making three, $400, uh, uh or with three of my buddies at one time, we make it two, $300 a month. So um, that was right away. I'm like, wow, this is great. Um, and I own the place. And, you know, I've, I've uh, always enjoyed from time to time looking at the statements and watching that principal balance go down. And that's where I kind of started from the beginning. And that, that was pretty exciting to me um, um, doing that. Um, then ultimately, my second deal is really what introduced me to property management. Um, I bought a place. Uh, in leading up 2008, they had a bunch of condo conversions, uh, where they're taking apartments and turn them into condos. And they, um, they'd always sell that first kind of hundred for deep discount. And, uh, I got in early on one, uh, I think I paid 89,000 and, uh, you know, our intention was to rent it out and, and get cash flow. And ultimately we rented it out, put an ad in the paper. Uh, this was still 2003. And uh, uh, took the first sad story that uh, needed a place to live, and uh, they, they they moved in, and uh, I literally would probably go over there three four times a week and pick up a hundred hundred fifty dollars at a time because I was so afraid of uh, not being able to cover a second mortgage. And uh, ultimately, we filed for eviction, so I, I got a crash course in that, and I ended up doing a cash what well, modern day cash for keys with this tenant, uh, and. Uh, and it kind of made me realize, uh, you know, the realities of property management and, and renting and, and, and what uh, that whole process looks like and what a bad time it looks like. And uh, right away, I said, I am out. No more property management for me. Uh, we ultimately sold that place. And I think we made 
uh, you know, we ended up selling for like 140. So we, we made a really good chunk on it, which made me kind of keep going down the investment side of things. But uh, as far as property management goes, I was out at that time. Uh, and and uh, it wasn't until a couple other things happened in life that we got back into property management. But it gave me a real, real glimpse of what property management really is. So those first two deals kind of one, uh, first one recognized, uh, helped me recognize um, uh, someone else paying a mortgage. And the second one helped me kind of understand what, what bad property management looks like. Yeah. Uh, was there maybe somebody that you were talking to or did you read something that really pushed you to get that second property? Like what, what gave you the idea besides just having that extra, extra cash? Um, you know, I, I think I've always been trying to learn and uh, people, you know, I, I hate to say it out loud now, but people, you know, back then, you know, the, the, the Trump books were still big and it, it didn't really necessarily teach me stuff, but it, gave the message of real estate. Real estate's the way to do it. Um, you know, I, I, shortly after that, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, series started coming out. So, you know, piece all that stuff together and, and me realizing in college that uh, I went to school for telecommunication uh, management. And in college, uh, I remember sitting there one day, I, I think it was only about a third of the way through, and I, I looked around and, and, uh, and I was at a computer school and I looked around and, and I said, man, I cannot sit in the back office with all these very like uh, computer savvy people for the rest of my life. I, I got to be out. Like I got to do something. I realized right there, I'm like, this isn't for me. Like I got to go do something, build something or something like that. Um, and real estate ended up being that, uh, that uh, way I ended up going as far as building something. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and as you've been building your real estate business, um, what impact have, have systems played? Like, do you have any systems that you've set up? Like how have you structured uh, your business? Yeah, that's uh, it's a loaded question because uh, for so many years we didn't. Um, you know, we the word system was just like annoying. It's like, ah, oh, it means we got to write stuff down. Um, and uh, as we grew, as we wanted to ten uh, uh, x things or, or uh, hire employees, we we realized fast. Uh, and I got introduced to uh, there's a book uh, that came that was out uh, a handful of years ago called Work the System, and, and that was my first introduction to really systems and what it could do for a company. Um, and then ultimately we've built out, uh, we have, uh, for our company now, we have a knowledge base, which is based on my portal of all of our systems. So where we are today versus call it seven years ago, man, it's amazing where we're at. So if it, everything's got a system now. And if it's not, we're talking about, hey, we got to put something in writing to make this uh, going forward. So it's always kind of the talk around our meetings. So uh, we built out an entire task management system for our property management side uh, through Podio. Uh, that uh, is one of the big things that really helps us uh, stand top and be a top-notch uh, management provider. Gotcha. And um, how do you see your business changing over the next five years? Like, where do you think you'll end up? Um, so a lot of what we did, a lot of our growth in our property management development obviously came when the market, uh, tanked. Now, I don't know if, uh, we'll ever see that down again, but, uh, the, I think the opportunity comes when, when I hate the word this way, where other people are, I'll say, instead of scared, I'll say intimidated by what could or could not happen in the future. So that's what deals will pop up on the development side. People that are trying to sell will also they want to move to management and, uh, opportunity will continue to uh, kind of create itself even in a down market for the way that we're set up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you were sitting in school thinking, you know, about having to spend the rest of your life sitting with, sitting with all these people. Now, now that you've gone into real estate and have built a successful business, how has that changed your life? Um, so for me personally, um, I, I think, and I, the, the way I look at this is, and what I've came to terms with in the last year, so I just turned 38 the other day, and uh, sometimes you know, right around my birthday, I always get kind of deep with myself of uh, what's going to make me happy, you know, how many years do I got left to be happy, or what really ultimately makes me happy. And when I think about it, being, you know, whatever I see my company, whatever I could say my company is X amount of dollars in revenue or sell it for X amount uh, um, dollars to virtual, uh, uh, to, to uh, a fund or something like that. I don't know if I'd be any more happy in those points than I would today. So kind of understanding what makes me happy and enjoying the ride. So if anything I've learned in the last couple of years is trying to enjoy the ride instead of making every day like, oh my gosh, this is what a tough day. It's trying to figure out a way to enjoy it. Um, so that no matter what happens, um, I still have kind of myself to that uh, is, 
happy for whatever reason I'm feeling I should be happy. I, got, I hope that wasn't too deep. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> hey, every or, time it was clear enough that anyone is. Yeah, every time on my birthday, I just look at how far back my hair is going. <laughs> That's, uh, oh, man. Well, we're on video now, so you can see mine too, man. I, yeah. I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, and, and and so, too, my head back a little right now. <laughs> yeah. I'll start wearing a baseball hat in a couple of years. <laughs> Uh, so, so in terms of, of what real estate's allowed you to do, like, do you think your, your lifestyle is a lot better than if you would have taken that computer path being stuck in the office? Yeah. Cause I think of what, yeah, yes. 100%. Uh, cause, uh, I think ultimately in the end, um, my, I, I get bored easy. Um, you know, I, I like a new challenge or I like finding a solution for a problem trying to implement it and moving on. But if I have to continue to, to reprogram that same solution forever, th that's not my strength. And my partners recognize that. So they, they put me, uh, you know, I do the new business stuff and I do the networking and all that, which is a different uh, journey every single day. So th they recognize that. So I appreciate that of them. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so I, I would have never been happy doing those things. And I think part of me feels that uh, no matter where our companies go, at worst case scenario, I could probably just uh, um, walk away and, and manage a handful of my properties and, and myself and, uh, and however that might split up and, and just live off that probably. So it's kind of the, uh, in the back of my head, it's like, oh, that's great. That's always an option. Even though I would never do that. Uh, it's just, I know that's always an option. So that's cool. Yeah, for, for sure. And uh, you, you mentioned something that, uh, let, let's talk about that for a little bit uh, before we end. Um, you and your partners, like you're doing a role that suits your strengths. Do you want to talk about how important that is in a business with multiple uh, partners? Yeah. So I've always been a partner uh, person. Um, I think almost every venture I've gone into, uh, I've had somebody on the other side to, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where, why, but uh, I feel when two people, you know, the whole theory of uh, you'd rather have 10% uh, uh, of uh, uh, 100 million versus 50% uh, of 100,000. <laughs> um, it's been always kind of my mentality of I'd rather be part of something bigger than, than control 100% of something. Um, so, you know, I've been in a bad partnership, uh, which uh, was, uh, wasn't clear to me at the time until I ultimately had uh, another good partnership. I've always been um so kind of going back my original partner with gc realty um he was my best friend i grew up with and he was killed in a car accident so my first partner um i had a part ways with but that was my option but i knew he was a good partner and, and we had we played off each other as yin and yang uh, then uh, came my, my partner brian who you know me and him are great like i don't know he's almost uh uh, he's great. Like we're very yin and yang. He's a little older than me, different network, different style. Um, so we, we definitely complement each other. And then our third partner, um, that we have is, uh, Cliff and, uh, you know, he, he's awesome. He, he's smart. And we, we recognized a handful of years ago, me and Brian, that, uh, we got it to this level. And if we want to take it to another level, um, we can't do it ourselves. And we need somebody, uh, with a little more, uh, uh operations back, uh, behind us. Yeah. So if somebody's out there uh, maybe looking to form a partnership, what sort of tips would you give them in terms of vetting a, a, a potential partner? You know, I think a lot of uh, partnerships are, are built out of uh, convenience, which might not always be the right way, or someone has an idea um, and the other person can do something with it. But understanding the structure um, of uh, the partnership going into it and, and what if you're sitting there three, five, seven years from now, what you expect that to look for and kind of laying out the expectations of each. I think, you know, too often you have a great idea and you say, this partner is do it. And everyone's kind of uh, excited about the idea and everyone glosses over the details. Even though the details are painful and they're boring and, and you don't want to think about breaking up with your, your, your best friend or your sister or whatnot. Those are things that just got to get done. Um, and if I had done that in a more clear matter with the one failed partnership I did have, um, I'd have more hair. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, Hey, that, that's a very honest answer. Um, and I, I, I think, um, in real estate investing as we build businesses, we'll always have those partnerships that 
don't work out and we always have to reflect back and, and ask ourselves why. And uh, you made a really great point with, with the details. You know, most people don't like doing details, um, but uh, you know, th those issues compound themselves um, if they're not checked. So, so Mark, uh, if, if somebody's looking for uh, some more information about you and your business, uh, where can they uh, find you and get in touch? Well, you definitely uh, can find me on Facebook, but I probably won't reply because I don't uh, check it off enough. But, uh, um, you know, I always put my cell phone out there, um, uh, 630-781-6744, and hopefully you'll include that in the show notes. But I've always put myself out there for especially out-of-state guys, out-of-country guys, uh, uh, as kind of a resource in Chicago. Um, so uh, reach out to me if you have any questions in Chicago or uh, anything uh, – you know, I get out in front of these uh, RIAs a lot, and uh, a lot of what I talk about is what not to do um, or where I've made mistakes. Because I've had a lot of uh, five and ten and fifteen thousand dollar hard knock uh, experiences where, and I do that a lot on places like Bigger Pockets. Like, oh, well, don't do that because this is what happened to me. And uh, yeah. so, anytime someone wants to reach out, uh, feel free, and, and I'll do what I can or point you in the right direction if I can. That, that's great. Well, Mark, just want to say thanks so much for taking the time and uh, sharing those stories with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it, it was great. It was fun. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well in your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.